Hello and welcome to On the Sunny Side. On the Sunny Side is a new digital TV format on the Forbes 15 YouTube channel by the German speaking edition of Forbes. I'm Sunny Grinnewald. I'm an entrepreneur and a Forbes under 30 list maker. And every week in On the Sunny Side, I meet with executives, researchers, entrepreneurs, basically digital shapers who are pushing the digital economy forward and who are helping us think about and also developing technology for good. So this week, I have an extraordinary guest with me, Dr. Chris Lipkeman. He's been the Director for Global Foresight Research and Innovation at Arup for 20 years, and is currently the Director for Strategic Foresight in the Office of the President at ETH Zurich, the Federal Institute of Technology, one of the world's best technological universities. So welcome to the show, Chris. So good to have you. Well, thank you very much, Sonny. It's great to be here with you. So for those who have tuned into a few of uh, my shows already, they know I always start with something called Sonny's Fast Five. There are five questions where basically I hope to elicit some of your wisdom in just a sentence. Would you be ready for that? <laughs> I'll try one sentence, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, you Go know. for it. All right. There we go. We'll see <laughs> what happens. It's got to be two. It's got to be two. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so easy one first. I'm sure you're yep. going to manage in one sentence. Uh, are you morning or night person? I'm whatever's needed. <laughs> and <laughs> in terms of, I guess in terms of, uh, as someone who's been announced on stages around the world as a futurist, mm. if I would give you a time machine, you could travel anywhere to any time, where would you go? Ooh, if I could jump into a time machine, I would probably want to go back to the age of steam because I'm an engineer at heart and I just can't help myself. And where would you go to? Where would you try to find, about, find out more about this episode? Ooh, you know, that's, that, that's a really difficult one to answer in one sentence at all, I tell you. Um, I, I, maybe coming to Switzerland to see as we started to build tunnels in the, in the gondolas and all these things, but probably to England, going back to London where it all kind of really kicked off and to see how those early experiments, those early entrepreneurs were able to really get their ideas through a very conservative society. So let's move again back into the present time. Yes. What are you learning right now? At the moment, I'm really learning the difference between the academic and the corporate cultures and how best to really apply the concepts of foresight within an academic environment. What is success to you? So success for me is if my kids are proud of what I do and how I do it. And that's not, not an easy one, frankly, but that's, that's how I really define it these days. Now, you have spent a lot of your life's work yep. in corporate foresight. Yep. For those who have maybe not even heard of the term or are not quite sure what to imagine when they hear it, could you try to explain that? perhaps uh, simple enough for a child to be able to follow? <laughs> In one sentence, sure. Um, to me, corporate foresight is essentially preparing today for the context of tomorrow. That's really, and, uh, and, and the tools we use to do that are quite varied, but that, basic, that is the basic concept. How do you prepare today for this crazy world of tomorrow, which we, can begin to imagine and anticipate. I mentioned it before, you have mm -hmm. been called a futurist. Um, you've spoken on stages really around the world because that was part of your role at Arup. Yep. What is a futurist and mm -hmm. what is he not? So what are some of the common misconceptions sure. perhaps? Well, one common, one common misperception that comes immediately is the difference between prediction and foresighting. I do not predict. I do not have a crystal ball in which I can say what the stock market is going to look like in, in six months, two years, or 20 years. I, I cannot, and I do not even begin to pretend to be able to predict. But what I do believe we can do when we work well together with a group or a 
with a company, country, or people, is think about what could the future be. To tell ourselves the stories of what tomorrow might look like. Because I do not believe in singularity. I do not believe that if we would walk around the planet, we would see one way of living. As a matter of fact, each one of us is an individual and each one of us has a different future. And so that's how do you create the collective story, acknowledging there are certain trends, macro trends, like climate change, demographic change, and the aging and youngering of our, some countries. These mega trends you can kind of use as an outline for that story, but then how they manifest for you, your family, your community, your company, really depends in many ways about the story you wish to write. Beautifully said. So, Thanks. as you have been someone writing your life story, learning every day about the future, yep. what has kept you motivated to do that? Good question. Um, I, I would have to say, you know, I, there are times when it has gotten hard, uh, but mostly I'm insanely curious. And my father taught me when I was quite young, he said, there's always something interesting in everybody. It's your job to find it. And I think this is something which is translated into other parts of my life and looking around the world, there's always something interesting there or there's something behind the story to try to understand more than what's e obvious or what's evident. And then be able to, to sort of flip that on its side to say, well, if that's why that's happening, well, could that then go to that? You know, so it's trying to, it's what I call the slingshot, always trying to understand what has happened and let that slingshot us forward into what could be into the future. And so that's, I think it's out of curiosity. I mean, I think that's what so many of us are trying more and more to do. I mean, we've just been through, uh, and in many parts of the world, star are in the middle mm -hmm. of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think yeah. all of us have in one way or another been grappling with the future. So I'm curious, yeah. I suppose two parts to this question. One, how have you been dealing mm -hmm. with the year 2020? And how do you advise others to think about the future? Another good question. So, you know, the, I, I'm very fortunate in that I have, uh, I have my health, I have a job, I can have a job which I can actually do on a laptop. Thinking is a big part of my world. So I have, I'm part of that, I'd say, a small percent who have been able to go through it. It's been very difficult to be alone. I mean, that has really been very awful for me. But I think when we look back at time, these kinds of events give, give clues as to the longer term impact. Okay, so I'll come back to myself in just a second. But I'm very often asked right now, what, what's the long term impact of, of this? And on one hand, I'd say there will be no long term impact. On the other hand, it'll be profound. It's okay, so, so that's really not an answer. Yes, it is. If we look at all the consumption graphs over the past, say, 20 years, 30 years, and every time we've had a blip, an economic environmental blip, it's just a blip, and we get right back onto the curve because humans have this incredible capability to forget. And it's both a boon and a bane. I think if, if women could not forget the pain that they went through to give birth, then we would never have a second child on this planet and humans would have disappeared. So, or we forget the pain of our first love, you know, and we've never fallen in love again, but we're able to forget these things. So this is the good part. The bad part is very often we neglect to learn the lessons, right? And so this time we've had to take a look at our long supply chain, to look at our consumptive behaviors, to look at the availability of, local skills that we never knew were available for us, it's good. could we actually take those lessons and leverage them forward? That's hard to know. 
I can also tell you that we only have fresh water supplies because of, you know, another cholera pandemic in London. All of a sudden they figured out that defecating in the same water that you drink is not a good idea. And so therefore we now separate our clean water and our dirty water. But it took a long time and a lot of sickness to figure that out. So this could have some longer term impacts on that. But I think what we all have to do is to think about the impacts that we have seen um, and to we, have to we have to internalize those ourselves and learn as much as we can about a virus. <laughs> I never knew I needed to know so much about a virus as I do now, but it becomes part of our DNA. And so all of us will at some point have that as part of our lives and of our story. Why do you think we were so stumped by this virus? Um, so many people like you mm -hmm. and in many other disciplines are looking to the future, trying to make sense. And yeah. you could sort of say globally, we just completely and utterly failed. Yeah, it's a very good point. I think it was politically uh, convenient not to pay attention to what the WHO had been saying for years, for what many other groups have been saying. So, uh, so, so, Will this kind of thing happen again? Yes, it will. You know, it is not the last time we will see this, nor is it the last time we will see environmental catastrophes like we saw the oil spill in the Arctic just recently that sort of slipped in through the news. You know, we, we see these again and again. So uh, the question then is, are we capable of assimilating those challenges? and creating the social and political will to face them realistically and pragmatically. And that's why this pandemic and a pandemic has been ignored because there is not the social or political will to look at it for what it really is. Now, many people watching this show are involved in, in digital technologies, are entrepreneurs mm -hmm. building them, uh, are very keen about the newest technological developments. Which technologies, perhaps digital technologies or otherwise as, a, as an engineer, um, are you looking mm -hmm. to towards the future and really thinking to yourself, you know what, this will make all the difference. This will truly mm -hmm. um, advance the greater good in this world um, and, and help us make better decisions. Okay, so those are three questions in one. <laughs> well done. Sometimes <laughs> so, I get ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good. You know, so I know the reason I say it. So, you know, I'm, I'm. So I think artificial. I think AI. So machine learning and pattern recognition, which is already being utilized for good, is an extremely powerful uh, capability, and I see that for being able to predict and find say, uh, social malice in the sense of um, you know, someone who's getting beaten or abused. You know, there are certain patterns which we can begin to see and, and try to, or being able to monitor environmental monitoring so we can see where dumping or cuttings occur. So we can, this pattern recognition and, and sensing is intensely powerful. And I'm super excited about that on one hand. On the other hand, I'm also very excited about robotics and the way in which uh, robotics, either it can help assist a human. So it's this, this symbiosis between the roboticist and the humanist, being able to reduce the danger in death involved with many activities, especially in construction or maintenance, you know, where we can actually reduce those dangers. So I'm very excited about the robotics side too. So those, so those two things I think for me are where I get super excited. And the last one, I just say the last one is also in, in chemical detection. So we can figure out with water, drinking water or groundwater through these you know, deep sensing and new techniques of being chemically identify the nasties in our water. I'm also getting super excited about that because water is life and water stress is causing mass migration and will continue to cause uh, great problems for the world. So that's me.
once again, I would have yes. loved to make this conversation longer than the show will grant me because Forbes 15 is all about 15 minutes yep. um, or 20 minutes if yep. I want to push my boundaries a little. <laughs> <laughs> now, yep. uh, just some parting advice. Uh, yes. You, you know, you're an incredible as uh, someone mm -hmm. who, who reads a lot and, and, yep. and, and broadly and interdisciplinarily. Um, what is a book or a resource that you really recommend to someone who wants to understand the future better? Yep. So um, quite surprisingly, I'm going to give you a book, which is this one right here, which I prepared, which is Keeping Ahead of Machines. It was written by Cornelia Spencer almost 50 years ago. And what's so fascinating to me is how so many things that she said have come to true and not come true. And so it's a way for us to remember the humbleness because to me, the digital transformation is a transformation. We're on a path. It's not the end in itself. It's part of a path. And that was, it's a very interesting book to help remind us that. Is there an organization or a cause or an initiative that you yep. think is important uh, my, re my viewers should, should hear about? You're involved yes. with some of the things. Absolutely. The Climate Music Project. This is, a, this is an organization, it is uh, started in California and San Francisco, bringing climate scientists, composers, and musicians together to try to make the climate change data visceral. Because we all, music touches us all inside of our hearts, not just our heads. And so how can music make us understand and appreciate the changes which Mother Earth is experiencing. And this is the Climate Music Project. It's very cool. Wow. Um, I'm definitely going to link both of those things, the book and also um, the Climate Music Project, in the YouTube comment section or the, the description section. Uh, last okay. parting advice, anything, uh, any motto, anything that has carried you through 2020 so far that you'd like to share with all of us? So, yes, I think that's a, an, a great question as well. I think... We make choices every day. So I'd say vote with your choices. Not only vote in those who are blessed to be in democracies, make sure we do vote, but vote with actions and try to, through those actions, be consciously the best ancestor that you could be. That would be my advice. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, Sonny, very, very much for doing this and for inviting me. So here on Forbes 15, it'll continue at 5.30 p.m. with Editor-in-Chief Klaus Fiala. He'll be um, hosting the show, The Greatest Business Minds, where he regularly meets CEOs and executives. And I urge you to tune in. It's always fantastic conversations about where the business world is going. Um, on my side, I'll be back again on Thursday, 4 p.m. here on Forbes 15. And I hope to see you then again, of course, on the sunny side. <laughs>